Hi, and welcome to another Facebook premiere. I'm Dan Stein, president of FAIR, and I am really honored to be joined by someone you don't see uh, here in Washington too often, Ira Melman, who's been with FAIR, my goodness, as long as I have, almost 40 years, valued person who normally works on the West Coast out of Seattle, but who those of you who follow this issue for many years will have seen him on Fox News and read his op-eds, including a recent one uh, in Fox News this weekend that talks about... Uh, how the Democrats are committing political suicide with an immigration plan that seems completely out of touch with the average American voter. And here to tell you about it is in person is Ira. And so, Ira, what's the key point in this takeaway on this uh, piece you wrote? Well, the key point is that we have seen a shift now in where the Democrats are on immigration, a vast shift just over the past few years. If you go back to the Gang of Eight bill, which was up in Congress in 2013 and 2014, Chuck Schumer stood on the floor of the United States Senate and said, this is going to be the toughest enforcement bill ever passed. Uh, you know, he was willing to throw as much money at the problem as it would take. You know, he probably he saw it as a political essential, right? right? He saw it, it as had a, to be in favor of border controls, right? He most likely it would never have happened, which was one of the reasons that Fair opposed the bill. But at least he felt the need back then to tell the American public that we're really serious about this. Uh, you, you know, I guess you could say now at least they're being honest. That, yeah, well, that, that's but that's as recent as say maybe two thousand and eight, right? That, that was 2013. 2013. 2013 when he was saying this. So what could have happened in that short period of time, which to me, 2013 to 2019 is a short period of time. I mean, mm -hmm. at my age, it's very short. It, it is. It is a remarkable turnaround with just the, within the past few years. And there are probably a couple of factors. One, Donald Trump, and that anything that Trump is in favor of, the Democrats are necessarily going to be opposed to. No matter how unpopular the idea. Right. Uh, the, the second, in other words, if Trump articulates a position that 90% of the people support, the Democrats are going to oppose it? Pretty much. Uh, you know, the, the, the and other... That's, and that's a strategy, why? Who are you, who you pull in that way? Well, look, I mean, even among people who support Trump's policies, he has very high negative ratings. Uh, you know, people may like his policies, they don't necessarily like him, and I think that may play into the politics in this. Uh, but also the, the... Ira, I can not stand my investment advisor. I might hate my investment <laughs> advisor. But if, if he's he makes doubling money... my money every week... He can, I can hate him till the cows come home. If he's he's going to be my investment advisor. If he's doing that, I'd like him to be my investment I'll counsel also. I'll give you also. his name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't understand. What's the, how, what is the political strategy behind these seasoned folks like Schumer? He didn't just fall off the uh, turnip truck. What's the, uh, well, the, the explanation? The, the other thing is that the Democrats have kind of created this monster here. They have tried to activate the far left that was really sitting out elections. And the Democrats realized that if they could just get these folks to the polls, uh, they could win elections. And you saw that, that was true in, in 2008. It worked for Barack Obama, it has worked at other points. But what is, has happened now is they've kind of created their own monster here and it is taking over the party to a point where you see Nancy Pelosi has to go behind closed doors and tell these folks to just take a deep breath and calm down because you're, you know, th this is reckless. And, and, but I'm not sure you can get the genie back in the bottle. Uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are going to have to live with the consequences of what they've created here. And these people really do want open borders. And you see it in the debates now. If you looked at, if you watched those first debates in Miami a couple of weeks ago, they're for de decriminalizing illegal immigration. Uh, they are for giving everybody every benefit possible, including subsidized health care. This is I mean, where, where they're going. How do you want this thing back? I mean, have they let the Botox out of the tube? <laughs> <laughs> I, I How do you get it back in? How do you get the genes back in the box? I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. I mean, they painted themselves in a corner. It's almost like after the Obama administration, Hillary Clinton continued the policies, even though Obama himself never really articulated this open border, no border mm -hmm. position. Somehow Hillary Clinton doubled down and extended, mm -hmm. and then the whole party shifted to the mm -hmm. left, and now they think somehow they can carry the White right. House in 20, uh, 2020. Yeah, with this policy. And, and, and it's not just, you know, people like y you and me mm. that, that are noticing this. 
uh, even you know noted political commentators, uh, even Jay Johnson, President Obama's uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, felt the need to pen an, uh, an op-ed, I believe it was in the Washington Post, saying, you guys are nuts, uh, you know, we can't do this. Um, you know, even those of us who support very generous immigration <clears throat> and focusing on just enforcing the law against certain groups of illegal aliens, you guys are just taking this to a whole new extreme. And you saw that also, Andrew Sullivan in, the, in New York Magazine, Jeff Greenfield in Politico, all of them seem to be uh, agreeing on the fact that the Democrats are losing their minds on this. So how, how was your op-ed received on Fox News? Apparently it, it was received pretty well. It uh, apparently got the, it was the second leading um, op-ed in terms of the number of likes or whatever, however they measure pushed it. pushed out very yeah. how, wh whatever, uh, whatever they used to measure it, they measured it highly. Well, then we had another discussion, another op-ed, another article. You helped me with some of that too, but we went to an analysis of these new regulations on asylum that the administration is putting out. Now, in our view, these regulations are both constitutional and consistent with international law, as well as U.S. law, it requires the administration to consider the behavior of people before they get to the U.S. border to decide whether or not they can enter, actually make an asylum claim. The administration is saying that if you went through a safe country and you could have made the asylum claim there, that you have to do that. That does several things. One is it discourages fraud. It requires people to uh, if they're truly refugees, make the claim where they, the first opportunity, not where they want to live. International law does not require this country to allow refugees or people who claim to be refugees to file a claim wherever they happen to get to, but instead at the first location where they might have made the claim. Now, of course, the ACLU is going to try to enjoin these regulations because the position of them, and now unfortunately it seems the Democratic Party, is that the whole world can show up at our border, no limits, without limit, the whole world, and make an asylum claim and get a work document, get released and be in the country and disappear. International law can't possibly expect any country to do that and still remain a sovereign state. But what do you predict is gonna happen to these regulations? Well, they're gonna be tied up in courts probably. The ACLU has already filed suit and they're probably going to find a judge that's going to slap an injunction. Uh, you know, in the long run, it, it, it has to happen. It, it is unsustainable. Well, how could Congress have ever intended? It, how could it a was, judge look at this and say, I understand the wording of the law, but it says that there's a safe country agreement or what have you. I mean, when Congress enacted this, the asylum law, it was a it was, Cold War right. situation, very small numbers. They expected maybe 10,000 a year maximum, and there would be a certain number who could adjust the green card status. The idea was for temporary protection to work for political change back home so you can go home when it's safe to do so. Not a backdoor immigration program, not a way to game our humanitarian system the way it's being done now, right? Right, I mean, it was great propaganda value when a Soviet ballerina slipped away from her, her hotel in the middle of the night, uh, embarrassed the Soviet Union, but that was, you know, it was codified in 1980. We were still fighting the Cold War back then. And now the situation is very different. The, you know, the Soviets and the Eastern Bloc countries try to keep their people from leaving. So now you've got these governments in Central America saying, go, just and, and go on. And why do these governments care? Why do they want to lose all their people? They, you know, they're not, the, the Cold War was an ideological battle as much as a military battle. And the Soviets had to keep demonstrating to the rest of the world that this is a great system. And anytime somebody left, it, it put, shone a bad light on them. The folks in Central America and some of these other countries that are sending large numbers, they don't particularly care. They're, they're not image conscious. They're, they're not trying to spread any kind of ideology. They're just trying to keep their corrupt system in place. So uh, actually looting. what we're doing is promoting sustained corruption in the home country uh, by, by offloading what might be the for source of positive change. Absolutely. Which is how I got into this mm -hmm. issue decades ago, seeing that our immigration policies were undercutting the objectives of our foreign policy. Yeah, and, and it's also inherently unfair. You have people who have the advantage of proximity, the folks in Central America, or who can afford to pay a smuggler to get them to the U.S. border. You have millions of people who also are deserving, probably more deserving, who can't get here. Uh, they're stuck in some squalid refugee camp, uh, and it essentially skews the whole process in favor of those people who have access and against people who may have a better claim to coming to the United States, but they just simply cannot get here. So, I mean, in any area of public policy, you have to be prepared to balance the practical realities of resource limitations and national objectives against the interests of people who want to come to this country or use the system. Mm -hmm. When did the ACLU get to the point where they were so 
if you will, enslaved by this radical ideology of trying to force, using the courts, down, force down the throats of the American people, what is obviously an unsustainable and unworkable series of interpretations of the law. Right. You, you know, I'm not sure there's any specific point that you can put your finger on. It, it's been an evolutionary process. They've kind of been moving in this direction for years and years, and now they've come to a point where they see any restriction on what anybody wants to do, at least in terms of immigration, as somehow unconstitutional. And, you know, what is happening, if you look at the, the backlogs in the federal courts, 900,000 asylum cases pending, you, you, it doesn't matter how many judges you appoint, that they're never going to be able to go through those in any kind of reasonable time frame and come to a rational conclusion. They've made a mockery of it. They've made a mockery. And, they don't, and yet they still don't think there's enough procedural process. They want more. They want an independent Article One court. And even now, a final order of removal issued by an immigration judge has no meaning, apparently. Why are these immigration judges getting up and going to work? If they issue a final order of removal and nobody goes home, right. and why is this okay with the ACLU? Right. Why is it okay that the advocates don't care about the collapse of the rule of law? Because I think that may be, it may be one of their objectives, uh, you know, to basically tie the system up in knots, paralyzing the system works to their advantage. All right, Ira's been at this a long time, okay? So I'm gonna ask him, what is the agenda? Ultimately, what's the agenda of these advocates and organizations that appear to be trying to destroy this country's ability to regulate immigration? Well, I, I, I you know, I have no way of Give them knowing, the truth. I, but I'm just- Tell them the truth. Give yeah. them the whole truth. Tell them everything. You know, I think if you look at it uh, and, and sort of see what's going on and try to figure out what, it, what their motives are, the motive probably is to change the political nature of the United States. You know, you have the uh, the rise of the social democrats in the in the Democratic Party, the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. Well, you know, the American public has always been re resistant to those ideas. They have consistently voted against those ideas. And so, you know, they have figured out, well, you know, if we want to get this done, we're going to have to bring in voters who are going to vote for those things, and they see this as a way. So, you well, know, we have you, no way of knowing for sure if 500 million people come pouring in how they're going to vote, right? Chances so are. So is it really about how they're going to vote, or are they just simply trying to destabilize the political system enough to try to bring about radical change? Well, it, it, they, those two are not necessarily. So restructure the system yeah, itself. They're not exclusive goals. Of yeah. course. They can both they, happen. They can both happen, and I think they're both, that, that is exactly what they're trying to do here, is that they want to restructure the political system in this country to be kind of a social democratic society. Um, that the American public, or at least the existing American public, has resisted for quite some time. And so, you know, you, you, it's harder, it's easier to bring in new people and kind of dilute their vote than it is to get rid of the old people, uh, although time will eventually do that. But that seems to be where they're headed and what their objective is. So it sounds like the work we're doing here at FAIR is very important. So as we leave now, I'm going to ask Iris something I've never asked him before. Tell the folks why they should support FAIR. Well, they should support FAIR because we are trying to represent the interest of the American people in the immigration debate. And that, people tend to forget that, that it, the primary constituency for U.S. immigration policy is us, the American people. Uh, and, you know, other people are stakeholders. The immigrants, people who want to come here, they have an interest, but really this is about what is best for the American people, and we deserve a voice. FAIR, your voice, your vision, your values. Appreciate your support. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Ira. Good to be here.